I want to welcome everyone to week two of this year's Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Jeff McDonald, and I'm the Associate Director of the Global Institute for Water Security. And it's a, a pleasure to welcome our speaker, Gia Destowney, who I will introduce shortly. Don't forget that next week we have Andrea Ronaldo coming from EPFL in Switzerland. And also at the end of this one hour talk, for those early career folks that are interested, we will stay on the call with Gia for a little bit of discussion, uh, mixing science, mixing uh, early career mentoring ideas, and uh, generally picking her brain as the new editor in chief also of water resources research. So Gia has many, I think, things that could be useful in our just informal conversations about early career. Now, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we're on, uh, we're coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, homeland of the Métis, and our water research program at University of Saskatchewan recognizes and respects these First Nations and Métis ancestors, and we really strive to work with them to address water resource issues. Uh, we're sponsored by the Global Institute for Water Security, so we thank Jay Famiglietti, our, our director for sponsorship. We're also sponsored by uh, the Global Water Futures uh, program led by John Pomeroy, and we are. this is a, an output of Global Water Futures, so we welcome our partners who are tuning in. We have about 80 registrants for this, so that's a terrific, uh, a terrific group, and we welcome our partners from outside of University of Saskatchewan as well. We also welcome the students that are taking us for uh, credit through the Masters of Water Security program as their 990 seminar. Uh, that's the group both in Saskatchewan and also at Beijing Normal University who are watching this in a time delay on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Gia Destowney. I've known Gia for many years now through our interconnections and water resources. She's a professor of hydrology, hydrometeorology and water resources at, at, uh, at Stockholm. She's head of uh, the Department of Physical Geography. And Gia is really an international thought leader in the area of hydroclimate and how human impacts are altering our water quantity and quality. Uh, she's made immense contributions through her studies, focusing geographically uh, in diverse areas from the Baltic to the Arctic, uh, Central and East Asia, uh, the Balkans, the Mediterranean, where she's coming to us uh, live from now. So uh, we're just so thrilled to have Gia with us. She's been very well recognized in terms of uh, her uh, accomplishments and impact in research. She's a member of the Royal Swedish uh, uh, Academy of Sciences. She's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. Uh, she won the EGU Henry Darcy Medal, and she holds the Swedish Sige Thervon Grand Prize for Sustainability Research. Uh, and as I said, she is the incoming, uh, well, now she is the editor-in-chief of Water Resources Research, our flagship journal, and she's taken over from our very own uh, Martin Clark, who's likely on the call today as well. So Martin is uh, feeling very relaxed these days, and uh, some of that burden has moved <laughs> to Gia, but we feel like we're in very, very good hands, and it's a pleasure to have you with us, Gia. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for this <laughs> extremely kind introduction. And I'll get started immediately uh, by sharing my screen. Uh, now I need to find the presentation again. Uh, where is it? There. Share. And do you see it in show mode now? You do, right? Yeah. So now I don't see you. Uh, so if there is something you want, you know, just stop me. Uh, but uh, I, I can't see any messages or anything like that. So okay, all is good. So, all is good. All right, good, good. Uh, so thank you so much for the invitation to give this talk with you today. And I also, before starting, I want to thank my co-workers uh, on most of the work that I will be presenting today. That's Navid Gayania, Sara Kalantari, and Rene Ort. Uh, and I'm going to talk about large-scale hydrological co-variation patterns. And I have the key messages already here in the title page. 
uh, it's that they are essential for water security. They actually, uh, such patterns do quite clearly emerge from data from around the world. And these covariation patterns are not captured well by a large scale earth system modeling and reanalysis. So I will end, uh, I will take you from here to ending uh, the talk by uh, having explained uh, these different points. But this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so hydrology, uh, the focus of, of our science is mainly on the Earth's freshwater system. And uh, we tend to think of that system as something very local and indeed, when we compare it to all water on Earth, it is a very, very small uh, system, as this nice uh, picture here uh, illustrates. But even uh, it's an essential si system for all life and all human societies and sectors on land. And even though it's so small, we tend to cut it in many different ways and, and cut is what we mostly do to explore it. Um, so one way to cut this system uh, that I will start with here is uh, in the green and blue water. This is a distinction suggested as a new ground for water resources planning and management some 15, it's, yeah, 15 years ago now by Falken, Mark and Rockström. And the, the point, the basic assumption of this way to cut the system is that soil moisture is the green water resource and it is fed then by precipitation and predominantly feeding the green water flow of evapotranspiration. Well, the blue water resource is that in aquifers, lakes and dams, and it's predominantly then feeding the blue water flow through rivers and aquifers, and to some degree also the green water evapotranspiration flow. And the reason that Falkenmark and Rockström gave for uh, suggesting this uh, distinction and way of thinking about the freshwater system is that the in their view, the conventional water resource planning and management focus is on liquid water, blue water, as this has served the needs of engineers that have been involved in water supply and infrastructure projects. But when analyzing vegetation, food production, there is a need to incorporate the green water resource as moisture in the soil and the green vapor flow back to the atmosphere. So uh, this, this way to think about the freshwater system in a way fits with uh, thinking about traditional hydrological modeling of uh, rainfall runoff, the rainfall runoff pathway, the blue water pathway, uh, the typical scale for this would be a, a catchment. And mostly until uh, recent times, this has been a single catchment or a few comparative catchments. The green water pathway then of precipitation, soil moisture, evapotranspiration back to the atmosphere. This has, uh, is uh, a subject of, the, of eco hydrology, that branch of hydrology that has emerged in more recent times. And the typical scale here is uh, local or, or catchment, catchment, but that is cut above the groundwater. And as is illustrated in this figure here, uh, then the flow from soil to groundwater is, is uh, often uh, then just considered as a loss term. But the green and blue water in reality, of course, interacts. And the questions that we have been asking in the couple of papers that I will focus on presenting today is what do these inter interactions look like across different scales from local to catchment and to numerous catchments aggregated to even larger scale, continental and up to global. 
So to do, um, to find this out, we have looked at numerous catchments and their various aggregations. Uh, first, to start with around Europe. That's the first paper uh, that I will be talking about. Uh, Gayani et al was published in Scientific Reports last year. And there we looked at 1,378 catchments. And then we extended, uh, after seeing the findings there, we extended the analysis to around the world, uh, uh, looking at 6,405 overlapping catchments over the world, and for comparison also a subset of 155 large non-overlapping catchments. And this is a paper just in press now in water resources research. And I think you got um, a preprint of that published uh, before it was through the whole review process. But now it's, it's on, it way, on its way to be published too. So the questions we have been asking then in these papers is uh, first of all, well, it's a hypothesis really that some clear large scale covariation patterns may emerge from actual data looking over many different catchments. And we test this hypothesis. And in the first paper uh, from last year, we looked at soil moisture at the center of all the hydrological links uh, of blue water with green water and the subsurface and surface water flows and back to uh, precipitation uh, through the green water flux. That's what this schematic figure illustrates here, the links that are there, but the question is, uh, uh, do, do we see patterns from these links emerging at large scales? So is it just a lot of noise due to the large heterogeneity of, of hydrological processes? So in the first paper, we, we looked at soil moisture as that is at the center of this as a regulator and really ask the question, is it a green or a blue resource or both? If you remember then uh, uh, Falken, Malk and Rockström saw this as the green water resource, but it is also linked with all uh, blue water flows and resources. And uh, then what uh, if these patterns emerge and uh, uh, when we see what soil moisture, how it works in this network of connections, what is the dependent, dependence on scale and climatic region in these interactions and their patterns. And uh, having indeed identified some data-based emergent large-scale covariation patterns from the first paper with focus on Europe, we then went on and, uh, and uh, looked um, around the, the world, but also extended the analysis to see if and how well these patterns that we see from data how well are they represented in Earth system, uh, global climate models and reanalysis products? And again, what is the dependence uh, of this representation, good or bad representation on scale and region? So these are the uh, specific questions asked in these two studies. And common for the studies is that uh, the catchment selection has been based on data availability. And then we consider both station-based data and reanalysis complements of the data. And the bar variables we are looking at are precipitation, evapotranspiration, runoff, soil moisture, and, tem and temperature where precipitation, runoff, and temperature, for those variables, we do have station-based uh, data, but there are also data from reanalysis products and from uh, Earth system models. Whereas from a, for evapotranspiration and soil moisture at those large scales, uh, the data are mostly from, are from on those scales are from uh, reanalysis and Earth system models. So we have looked at the study period from 1980 to 2010, 
uh, because that is a period where we can find most of this data uh, for these variables uh, in most catchments around the world. And we have been looking at monthly values and their anomalies from average conditions of these variables and covariations between pairs of variables. So we have been looking at linear correlations, not because we assume there to be linear correlations, but because this is the simplest possible and most direct type of relationship uh, that we can look at that may emerge from data. And if we do indeed find strong linear correlations uh, for some of uh, some variable pairs, that does indicate a close covariation indeed. That doesn't mean the others are not uh, covarying, but uh, they are doing so in more, uh, uh, well, uh, complex, nonlinear, more convoluted ways. So these are the common uh, aspects of both studies. And let's then start uh, focusing on the first study looking at uh, Europe uh, with the 1378 catchments and uh, also dividing Europe and looking at its three distinct climate regions as identified by IPCC, North Europe, Central Europe and South Europe. So this is a complex <laughs> slide, I will guide you through it. So we have the variables to the left and the uh, arrows, uh, the colors of the arrows show which are for which we have station-based data, the red arrows, and for which we have um, um, reanalysis and model data. Those are the blue arrows. And from all these different uh, types uh, of uh, data, uh, different sources, we have um, uh, formed three different distinct data sets. Uh, so uh, one is called the fully independent data set, and that includes all the station data where there are station data, ground-based station data and the complements from reanalysis uh, from um, different reanalysis products. So one is uh, GLEAM from which we got evapotranspiration and the other is uh, IRA um, uh, reanalysis product uh, from which we got soil moisture. So that's the independent, fully independent data set. Then we looked at an internally consistent data set. That means uh, we take all the data consistently from one reanalysis product. That's the era interim land uh, era interim reanalysis, except for runoff, for which we only had um, um, independent station-based data the GCIN database. And then we have an intermediate uh, uh, data set where we mix station-based data and, uh, and different reanalysis products for uh, precipitation and soil moisture. So the reason we are looking at three different data sets is just because that there are so many uh, uh, sets of data for the same variables, the same period, the same catchments. So it's one of our questions, of course, then how uh, consistent uh, patterns uh, do we get from looking at the, the different data sets, different types of data sets. So jumping into some results, uh, what you see here, because the focus of this paper was on soil moisture and how it co-varies with other main uh, hydrological variables. So you have uh, in the column to the left, you have its um, uh, co-variation in terms uh, of uh, scatter plot of all the different uh, monthly data that is available with precipitation. Uh, the mid column is with evapotranspiration and the right column is with runoff. 
And the roads represent results for North Europe, uh, Central Europe and Southern Europe. And uh, from directly from these patterns, you can see that uh, the correlation between runoff and soil moisture is very strong. Uh, and values of the coefficient of variation for this correlation are above 0 0.6 uh, up to 0 0.71 or uh, I think I can't see the top number now but it's above 0 0.7 for the north whereas the other uh, correlations are considerably weaker and uh, for both precipitation and evapotranspiration with soil moisture and across all the climate zones, main climate zones of Europe. Even uh, may perhaps even more importantly is that you can, if one looks also at uh, extreme values, one can see that, for example, an extreme uh, value in uh, say precipitation can uh, just as well uh, coincide with a normal value for soil moisture or even relatively dry as, uh, 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 as uh, uh, an extreme value in soil moisture also. Whereas for runoff, we actually do get extreme values uh, quite well uh, um, coinciding with each other for soil moisture and runoff. If we break down uh, uh, this cor these correlation results month by month, um, that is what you see here. And you have here now in the column, uh, the, the left column are results for Northern Europe, the mid column for Central Europe, the right column for Southern Europe. And uh, you have the diff three different data sets as rows, the fully independent, the intermediate, and the eternally consistent era-based data set. And we are looking at monthly correlation uh, or coefficient of the determination uh, values are squared for soil moisture with runoff. Those are the light blue curves uh, going month by month around the year. The dark blue is uh, precipitation, the green is evapotranspiration, and, and red is temperature. And also for these monthly correlations, the, the, the correlation between soil moisture and runoff emerges as, as really the strongest one uh, across all data sets and across all three climate regions. So soil moisture then looking at these results emerges from the data that are available as at least as blue as it is green. Does that also make mechanistic sense? Well, it, it actually does when thinking that uh, how so soil moisture is very closely related to groundwater table, which is a blue water resource. And the groundwater table varies in time and the soil moisture varies with the blue groundwater table variations. And the groundwater table variations are what, what gives uh, the hydraulic gradients that drive the groundwater flow through the aquifers and feeding the total blue runoff that we measure in streams. So there is indeed the mechanistic reason to, uh, for, uh, for um, soil moisture to be closely related uh, with the runoff. And in fact, the paper cited here from 2014 uh, is uh, a paper where we have also mechanistically developed equations for these links and uh, and shown that they are indeed uh, based on the, those simplified equations uh, should be uh, relate closely related to each other. But a typical question I got from some hydrologists uh, uh, when presenting those results was, 
But what has soil moisture to do with runoff? Why would you even you know, think of correlate, of, of linking those in, in such a system description? Well, we now see from data that they are indeed closely related, emerge as closely related. Um, so there is mechanistic reason to think uh, that through groundwater level variations that also determine the blue groundwater flow that feeds the total runoff through catchments, uh, soil moisture uh, is uh, uh, very closely related to both blue and uh, green water flows. Uh, but what this also does is emphasizes the catchment scale importance of groundwater, of the groundwater flow pathway to total runoff. Because if this was just a, a relatively small contribution, we wouldn't see those strong correlations. Um, between soil moisture and, and total runoff uh, across so many catchments over the world. Um, so this is one implication that we see from, uh, from these results is that uh, uh, whole catchment considerations cannot just cut a catchment above the groundwater table and consider the groundwater recharge term as, as, as a loss term in catchment scale water balance. There is really uh, the, the blue and the green water pathways are really uh, truly interconnected also substantially with substantial signal and not just uh, small noise uh, in whole catchment uh, water balance. So uh, we, as I started with saying, we tend to cut uh, the water, the freshwater system into many different parts uh, to explore and go deeper into understanding the different components. But we also need to uncut and couple the system on land uh, with consideration of the blue subsurface to surface flow pathway of soil moisture, ground, run, groundwater to runoff as a key part in the overall green-blue water interactions. So we got these emergent um, and correlations from results for Europe. And our next, next uh, questions then were, does this also apply and emerge in other parts of the world? Where and under which conditions? And how well is this correlation pattern represented in Earth system global climate models and reanalysis products? So those were the main questions for the second paper. And here we looked at uh, more than 6,000 overlapping catchments and also a subset of 155 large non-overlapping catchments. And uh, whereas in Europe, we have three different climate zones uh, as identified by the IPCC, we here looked at different climates in terms of their aridity index, potential evapotranspiration over precipitation, uh, from which we uh, defined then uh, four different water-related climate classes of uh, energy-limited catchments, where there is plenty of water, but relatively cold, and water-limited um, catchments where there is uh, lots of energy to, uh, as reflected in potential evapotranspiration, but not so much water uh, for that energy to, to be used for evapotranspiration. So here again, we are looking at the same variables, precipitation, evapotranspiration, runoff, soil moisture and temperature. Uh, we have introduced uh, yet one more uh, reanalysis product, uh, GLDAS, in the analysis, which is the NASA Goddard Earth Science data, um, providing that. 
And we have also looked and compared the results uh, for um, a number of Earth system models. Those are listed here. And the reason we chose those models is that previous studies we had made uh, showed these to be among the most well performing uh, for hydrological uh, purposes. Uh, and here we have uh, then structured the different data into, first of all, three uh, semi-observational data sets. That means data sets where we use all the actual observation, station observation uh, sources for all the variables from, for which we can get such data, the precipitation, runoff, temperature. And then we use um, data from, re from different reanalysis products for soil moisture and evapotranspiration. Then we have two data sets using only reanalysis products from ERA-5 and from GLDAS. And then we have the five different Earth system models uh, and the, the same variables from there. And we are now looking, we are not just focusing on soil moisture. Soil moisture is included, but we look at correlations between all the different pairs of variables. So uh, we are looking at uh, the blue colors in this result. These are results for uh, the coefficient of determination resulting for different pairs of variables. The blue colors are for covariation between precipitation and runoff gray between precipitation and evapotranspiration, yellow, brown between precipitation and soil moisture, red between soil moisture and runoff, and green between soil moisture and evapotranspiration. And the nuances are such that the darker colors are for very energy limited um, catchments towards the lightest color, which is for very water limited catchments. And we see here again for data uh, around the world uh, that, uh, that again the correlation between soil moisture and runoff emerges as the strongest one. And all the other ones are considerably weaker in, including the precipitation runoff uh, correlation. Uh, the soil moisture evapotranspiration uh, uh, correlation is also relatively weak for wet uh, catchments, but increases as we go to more um, water limited conditions. And we get this picture, this pattern consistently from all three different semi observational data sets. The statistics here are area weighted, which means the, the, the results give greater importance for to large catchments for large scale patterns. So this is more descriptive of what we could see happening over large areas of the world. Then we compare this with the, the pure reanalysis uh, results. And um, you can see uh, that the reanalysis products, in fact, capture a high correlation between soil moisture and runoff, uh, which is even a bit higher than, uh, than that given from the observational data. But they also, they, uh, they don't really capture, they have opposite direction of how that correlation changes uh, with more energy or more water limited conditions. Uh, they also tend to overestimate the precipitation runoff correlation in comparison with the semi-observational data. But overall, they, they capture the soil moisture evapotranspiration correlation quite, quite well, including the direction of change for greater water limitation. And when we finally look uh, what this looks like for various Earth system models, we have, I mean, they're all over the place. 
Uh, I have circled some extreme results here for, in different models. We have one model totally underestimating the soil moisture runoff correlation, the BCC model, panel F, and also the precipitation runoff correlation and, and very much overestimating the precipitation evapotranspiration correlation, uh, while other, other models uh, overestimate very much the, the precipitation runoff correlation and uh, uh, oh, may do quite well for the soil moisture runoff. But the results differ very widely between different models. So just picking one and using it does not in any way guarantee that the covari hydrological covariations are well represented. Um, so these were overlapping catchments. So we also asked the question, does this, the fact that they are uh, overlapping, does that uh, um, uh, change bias results in some way? So then we also took this subset of 155 large non-overlapping catchments and look at what the results look like for those. And then, um, just to, I'm not going to go through everything here, but just uh, they, they are very similar patterns uh, obtained from these 155 large catchments as from the overlapping but area weighted catchment results. And here you can also, I want to point out, you see the error bars in here uh, represent variability among catchments. And this is relatively small for these large catchments and also for area weighted results. Uh, but when we looked at the over, all the overlapping catchments uh, and uh, what uh, uh, sizes they represent, so you see here the distribution uh, uh, function for, for catchment area. Uh, and if we look at each catchment area, regardless if it's small or, or large, that means without weighting their statistics, that means we look at each catchment as an equally important system uh, as a unit, uh, regardless of its size. And we have looked at those statistics too. And before looking at them, uh, we note that 50% uh, of these of the total catchments then have an area of less than 1,000 square kilometers. While there are some catchments, uh, the largest ones go up to several million square kilometers. So there is a very wide range here in catchment size. So when we look at non-weighted statistics. These are uh, corresponding results as the ones we have seen before. Um, with equal importance for any every catchment, regardless of its size, uh, you can, at the top row, we get similar result of the soil moisture runoff correlation being overall the highest, but we get also higher correlation between precipitation and runoff when we look at the statistics, catchment statistics in this way. So it's pr primarily this precipitation runoff correlation that differs whether you look at area weighted or individual catch non-weighted catchment results. And the reason uh, we think uh, it the result uh, shifts a bit like this for PR correlation is because the smaller catchments uh, have a, uh, where there is more direct um, interaction and, and uh, precipitation input and runoff output uh, because they are so small and there is not so large variability within them, more variability among them. Uh, that's that's why we get more higher correlation for PR. And you see the high variability among catchments here. It's much, much higher than when we looked at the large catchments and uh, or the area weighted catchments. 
So now if we look at the comparison from the top row of semi-observational uh, data to the pure reanalysis, we still get uh, similar results of um, uh, when it comes to, to soy moisture runoff correlation that it is uh, high, uh, but the reanalysis products seem to capture that better when all the catchments are counted equally, whereas the opposite should have been expected because these are large scale products, but nevertheless, uh, the precipitation runoff uh, correlation uh, is, uh, is more or less on average as high as given by the observational data, but again, the direction of uh, of change as for more water limited conditions differs between the data and the, and the reanalysis products. And then in the bottom two rows is uh, what results we get from the earth system models. And um, again, there is huge uh, difference between the different models. Some see still nearly no correlation between soil moisture and runoff or between precipitation or, or, or and runoff. And, and some models uh, see huge correlations in between these variable pairs. Finally, one more check that we did is that in our uh, results, we have looked at root zone soil moisture. So not just the top layer, but a bit further down. And that's why we also get this uh, uh, stronger connection with runoff because there is closer connection to groundwater table. But if we instead uh, uh, do the same thing and let check for correlations with the near surface soil moisture, that uh, just the top layer, then we see as we had, uh, could expect that the soil moisture runoff correlation goes down. Uh, you see the area weighted statistics to the left for the semi-observational data set. Those are exactly uh, comparable with each other, except for using different soil moisture quantifications. Whereas the one to the right is using the near surface soil moisture uh, with a non-weighted statistics. So uh, even uh, when using near surface soil moisture, which many earth system models give uh, uh, consider is, is what they mostly consider, Still, the ESM results and reanalysis products are still inconsistent also with these database patterns. So there is an underlying bias here that is not just about which uh, depth of soil mo moisture uh, we use. Okay, and here is then a breakdown uh, month by month uh, for uh, one uh, observational um, example, one reanalysis example, and one ESM example. And you see again the same thing. Now red here uh, is the soil moisture runoff correlation. And uh, again, it emerges as the strongest one uh, across um, uh, all the different uh, hydroclimatic zones uh, from the observational data sets and also largely from, uh, from the reanalysis products, uh, even though they tend to overestimate the PR relationship and uh, the soil moisture evapotranspiration relationship a bit. Um, but uh, the earth system models, uh, again, uh, yeah, don't, don't capture these patterns, basically. That's the bottom uh, row example, and things look more or less similar, but in different ways for, for um, the other earth system models. Okay, then uh, we continued to, um, assess the model error and model I mean, both the reanalysis and the earth system models uh, compared with the semi-observational data sets. 
And you see here results in terms of mean absolute error, relative standard deviation, taking the observation, uh, one of the semi-observational data sets, the first one as uh, the measure of the, against which the error is evaluated. Um, so the different bars here represent the different variables, individual variables, and we see the greatest error overall for the mixed green, blue soil moisture variable, the yellow bars, and followed by the blue water runoff variable, where you can see, for example, compare with the temperature error, corresponding temperature errors in red, which are quite small. And then we have also looked at mean absolute error relative standard deviation for the coefficient of variation or square between variable um, uh, in each variable pair, maybe you should say. And so here uh, we see the greatest errors for the blue water pathways, soil moisture and runoff in red and precipitation and runoff followed, uh, follows after that. Um, and the greatest is for the strongest variation, soil moisture and runoff. What we can also see here is that relatively small individual variable error for precipitation, that's the dark blue on the left, they propagate or they, uh, transform into relatively large co-variation error uh, for uh, precipitation and runoff. Those are the blue uh, error bars on the right. So uh, I'm coming now to the conclusion and I will just go through the main points that I also uh, took up directly in my first slide. So large scale hydrological uh, covariation patterns are essential for water security. So covariability and, and shifts in these covariability of water fluxes, storages, droughts and floods and water quality, they imply risks and impacts, potential tipping points for a lot of different security aspects. Uh, in our society and for ecosystems. Water, food, energy security, water safety in terms of quality and pollution, risks uh, on, for infrastructure, built environment and infrastructure, and for human and animal ecosystem health on, on land and in coastal zones and the sea that are fed by the freshwater discharges. So it is, it, is, it is essential that we get these right and, and get them right uh, on, on over large scales because um, um, all these different impacts and risks exist on, on across all scales. Um, then uh, the, such large scale hydrological covariation patterns do emerge uh, based on data relatively clearly around the world. And they imply the need that I, uh, to couple the freshwater system on land, considering also the, the subsurface to surface uh, flow pathway as a key part of green blue water interactions and water system interactions in general. And finally, um, um, these large scale convari uh, hydrological covariation patterns that do emerge from data, they are not well captured by uh, earth system models and, uh, and reanalysis, but they need to be well captured because we rely on these uh, models and products for interpretation and projection of ongoing and forthcoming climate driven changes and their propagation through the freshwater system on land to various societal and ecosystem impacts, risks and potential tipping points. So I'm ready and thank you for listening and and take 
Any questions that you have? Great, thank you very much, Gia. Shall I stop sharing? Yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Ah, you I can, did it for me. I, okay. I can see some of the, the faces. I can't see everyone. We have a very large number on the call. So uh, yeah. I would say just type into the chat or unmute and chime in and I'll do my best to moderate. So questions for Gia. And Gia, while we wait for someone to chime in or raise their hand or, or type into the chat, mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's interesting thinking about the soil moisture runoff linkage as a as a hill slope hydrologist i think what emerged for me through the 70s and 80s with the uh, advent of isotope tracing is that most of the water in our streams even during an event is water that existed in the soil in the groundwater before the rain started falling or the snow yes. started melting so it's really interesting to see these lovely patterns emerge mm -hmm. uh, in terms of your your kind of anchoring mm -hmm. a, a, a similar kind of concept, but now kind of writ mm -hmm. large globally. So I found that mm -hmm. very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. This, this, these are tightly linked. And, yeah. and exactly what you describe, I think, is the reason why we see these patterns. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Gia, I have a I question. Questions are coming back, yeah. <laughs> coming up. Yeah. John, do you want to unmute or do you want me to ask it over? There we go. Um, I, sure, I, I, Gia, and I, I can ask it. Um, yeah, there's really interesting talk, and I think the spatial covariances are fundamental to hydrology, and it's important that some of the models at the land surface capture this. But uh, as really, uh, to what extent did you see time lags in the spatial covariance patterns as you're entering and leaving droughts? Um, you know, yeah. all the storage elements have different uh, uh, times associated with their change, and did that show up yeah. in your analysis? Yeah, well, um, yes, in, in the first analysis of Europe, we in fact checked for time lags and whether we could get stronger correlations for other variable pairs if we, you know, shifted a month back and forth the different variables. And the, of course, absolute results changed a bit with this one month shift back and forth, but but re in relative terms, uh, results were similar. Still, it was the soil moisture runoff uh, uh, covariation co that emerged as most uh, straightforward, linear, and strongest. But having said that, we are also other results going on where we are asking precisely that question that's not written up yet. But, but of course, if we had looked at daily values, we would find no correlation whatsoever between precipitation and runoff because it takes time for the system to equilibrate. So now we have shifted back and forth uh, one month uh, and, and we still don't see. Uh, so we ask the question in parallel work, how much do we, how, how large time aggregation do we need to have for precipitation and runoff to start showing up the correlation that we do in fact expect. Uh, and it turns out that it is several months. Uh, we might, I, I, we need the, we, again, we have looked around the world and of course that, that differs between catchments, but let's say we, we, it, we, we need something from half a year to one and a half year of aggregation scale in order to see the PR correlation. The, the, so it depends on how you aggregate. Uh, we are looking at monthly data because we also want, you know, we, we want to see uh, correlations in droughts and floods and those uh, need finer resolution that one, than one, one and a half year. So that's why. I don't know if I answered your question then. <laughs> uh, no, 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 you have. And we're, you know, of course, we're also very interested in Canada about the effect that snow is a damming force it uh, you get snowfall you don't get runoff so the uh, yeah. so how long is that damming impact and so that i presume is also important in northern europe yeah and exceptionally yes, yes, and exceptionally scale dependent as well i guess Gia, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get in many questions thanks very much john this is Thank one you. from uh Zhi Zhang. uh Gia, thanks very much for a great talk uh, a very great implication of the soil moisture runoff correlation 
to update runoff parameterization in these land surface models in which soil moisture may not explicitly emerge, for example, a top model based scheme. Uh, incorporating soil moisture and runoff parameterization may reflect this strong soil moisture runoff correlation shown in today's presentation. I guess that's more of a comment uh, than a mm -hmm. question from Zhi yeah. Zhang. Yeah. I don't know if you want to reflect yeah. on that at all. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I do think uh, that there are absolutely things we can do to improve these uh, representations uh, and of uh, soy moisture runoff correlation. And I, I wouldn't say simple, but, but <laughs> relatively straightforward. I, yeah, I do yeah. Think so. mm -hmm. Okay, looking for hands or just unmute. Anyone want to unmute? Jump in. While I wait for another hand to go up, Gia, wondering what you think of, mm -hmm. you know, this focus on the critical zone, thinking about mm -hmm. deeper storage beyond the, the, the soil profile, and its, its importance that we're seeing increasingly, both for evapotranspiration, you know, trees using rock mm -hmm. moisture, for instance, yeah. well below the soil profile, particularly in yeah. arid zones. But then also, you know, if we're thinking of the whole system as storage release, then trying to get that control volume, which extends well down into weathered rock, uh, could be important. Any, any brief yeah. reflections on that? Yeah, I think this is really important. And that's also part of this. The reason we were looking at this equilibration time between. So basically, when do we start to see the strong correlation that we do expect between precipitation and runoff? Yep. A part of that was um, we want to see where we have these differences in this equilibration time. And now we want to relate it with groundwater depth and what the critical zone looks like in those different catchments. So this is ongoing work. So I fully agree with you on its importance and we're looking for it. <laughs> okay, I'm just typing a message, mm -hmm. folks. All right, Gia, well, we're mm -hmm. just two minutes to the hour and the plan mm -hmm. now, if you're willing, is to uh, end this this formal presentation and to thank you for this uh, really interesting talk you you gave.